السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قال ذلك ما كنا نبغي فارتدى على آثارهما قصصا فوجد عبدا من عبادنا آتيناه رحمة من عندنا وعلمناه من لدنا علما قال له موسى هل أتبعك على أن تعلمني مما علمت رشدا رب الشح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين Once again everybody, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته I'm going to try and wrap up my recap of the ayat that I've already covered in a lecture series previously before continuing from ayah number 74. That's actually my goal in this series is to continue from ayah number 74. But because uh, I imagine many of you have not been following my series online, so it, it's beneficial because you guys are sitting here and maybe even some of the online audience to kind of get a recap of the story. Yesterday, I tried to capture some lessons from the first part of this story, uh, the part of the story where Musa alayhi salam is traveling with his own student. And they realize they've gone too far and they've now started to head back. Today we're going to pick up from there uh, and capture some main lessons from this next portion of the story. Mind you, in my own lecture series, I have not yet completed this portion, the discussions on this portion of the story. So I'll only highlight some things as I've covered them thus far. So, فَوَجَدَ عَبْدًا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا آتَيْنَاهُ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمَا They head back towards where they had come from. And they both now, remember this is the place where the, the fish went off in a strange way. But as they head back, they then, Allah says, then both of them found one of our slaves. Abdan min ibadina. One of our slaves. Uh, and so Allah does not tell us this person's name. Allah does not tell us any details about this individual. In fact, there's even a tafsir, minority versus majority positions. Is he a human being? Is he an angel? There are a hadith that point out that his name is Al-Khadir. There are different pronunciations. I'll stick with Khadir, right? Um, and then there are weaker narrations about why he's called that. So there's a lot of discussion around that. But our focus is not on all that secondary information. Our focus is why would Allah, the, the clearest of all speakers, who taught human beings bayan, allamahul bayan, he taught human beings how to be clear in their speech, right? And he gave us... The Qur'an that is mubin by definition, it is clear and clarifying by definition, he chose not to tell us who this person is by name. And he chose actually to even use a nakira form, abdan min ibadina. He didn't even say, fawajada abdana. Right? Then they both found our slave. No, one of our slaves. Abdan, a slave, literally would mean they both found a slave from among our slaves. It's really also very interesting that Allah did not, because from here on you're going to see that Musa alayhi salam is going to be alone with his teacher. So they're going to leave the student behind. So his role as a teacher is now finished and he's no longer going to carry Yusha ibn Nun. Yusha can go back, head back now. It's only going to be Musa alayhi salam and his new teacher from here on out. But finding him is something both of them accomplished together. فَوَجَدَا The muthanna form is used, the pair form is used of the verb to say both of them found him. Both of them found This is a significant detail because a lot of times when you find in the Qur'an, Musa alayhi salam is standing with Harun, for example. He's standing with Harun alayhi salam. But Allah will use qala, qala, qala. He said. He's not going to say qala, both of them said. Other places Allah will highlight the presence of both of them. Sometimes Allah will only highlight the presence of or the, the role of one of them, which is Musa alayhi salam. In this case, Allah could have just said, فَوَجَدَ He found him. So Musa alayhi salam found him, but he said both of them found him. This is significant again because a student that had failed him in the previous episode can actually recuperate and be helpful in now making up for that mistake. 
right? So your failure does not, your failure is that of a project. You failed at a task, but you yourself are not being defined as a failure. You can recover from a past failed event and then have success in future events. What happens a lot of times is one failure is used to, dis either you do this to yourself, you define yourself permanently as a fail. Oh my God, I failed. I'm such a loser. I'm a failure in life. I'm just, I'm never going to accomplish anything. And you beat yourself up and stamp yourself and tattoo failure on your face. That's what, you, you might do that to yourself. And even if you don't do that to yourself, others around you can take one of your failures and then slam you with it all the time. Right? And what Allah is teaching us implicitly is that you can have a failure and you get up and you restore, you make, make things right and you move forward. And you can still accomplish good. And so he's now still an assistant to Musa alayhi salam. And he still takes part in accomplishing that important mission that could have taken lifetimes. فَوَجَدَا عَبْدًا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا Now about this servant. Allah Azza wa Jal told Musa alayhi salam, in the hadith we learn, he told him that there's someone more knowledgeable than you. And you could have had the Qur'an be more in sync with the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah could have said here, فَوَجَدَ مَنْ كَانَ أَعْلَمَ مِنْهُ he, could, he found the one who was more knowledgeable than him. Because that's what he was looking for. The one who was knowledgeable. مَنْ سَيُعَلِّمُهُ The one who's going to teach him. But no, Allah says he found one of our servants. This is an important distinction. The highest of all teachers, the most knowledgeable prophet of Allah at the time, Musa alayhi salam, the, the, the recipient of Tawrat, even above him there is a teacher. And that teacher has even a higher ranking, and that highest ranking is described in the Qur'an as what? Abdan min ibadina. Just a slave from among many slaves that we have. Like just a slave. Like the term slave in society is used for the lowest status, historically. Somebody could be a farmer, a slave is lower than that. Somebody could be a cleaner, a slave is lower than that. Somebody could, you could have any job, but the lowest job you could have is what? Slave, that's the lowest you can have. But the slave of Allah is the highest honor a human being can have. And you know, when, when, when we become teachers, like if I, I used to be a preschool teacher, I've taught all kinds of things. I've taught, I've taught Arabic, I've taught in a college and I've taught at a preschool, right? So I've seen, all the strangeness humanity has to offer <laughs> right? in the classroom. But in any case, the point is, when you're teaching at a higher institution, if somebody's a professor at a high-end university, it comes with prestige, right? If somebody's teaching, teaching even children, it comes with prestige, but not like when you get into higher education. And if your students are PhD students, you're higher and higher and higher up, right? So the, the higher level knowledge you're teaching, the higher your prestige is. And here, what is Allah telling us in the world of learning Allah's deen. This is a different world than every other field of education. In this world, the higher up you go, you earn the highest possible ranking. And the highest possible ranking is Abdan min ibadina, a slave. You get to be one of our slaves. In other words, the, 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 the advancement in the knowledge of this deen, and the closer you become and I become to Allah, the more we identify ourselves as just another slave of Allah among others. We don't distinguish ourselves on the basis of our knowledge. Others can distinguish you. Others can distinguish you. Others can say, oh, mashallah, your tajweed is really good. Can you teach me? But you don't distinguish yourself. <coughs> Mr. Tajweed is here. Everybody rise. <laughs> you don't do that. You're not, you're not expecting special treatment. In fact, if you study the hadith, it's really cool. You know how they found him? He was wrapped up in a blanket lying on the beach. That's how they found him. And they came up to him and they said, uh, and he just looked at him and he goes, he said, Salam. Musa Ali Sam said, Salam. And he said, Anna bi al salam. And how, how is there any peace around here? So he, he basically kind of trolled him a little bit, the first conversation. And then he, after that, he said, Musa, Bani, Musa Bani Israel, Musa of Bani Israel. Oh, okay. It wasn't a, like a grand office or he was at the top of the mountain or he was just lying on the beach and the blanket sleeping. That's how he met him. And it's, a, it's by Allah's design. This was supposed to be the case, right? And just another person. And even the Quran describes him as just another slave. Why? Because Allah is teaching us through this a philosophy of education. The most knowledgeable, the most honorable teachers among us, what makes them the most honorable is their accessibility. In fact, it's their, it's their oneness with everybody else. 
You know, they're, they're, they're not requiring a special status or to be spoken to a special way or to be treated in a certain way or to have certain uniform that when, when they walk in, everybody is, oh, he's here. Okay, sit up straight. You know, <laughs> they don't need to have that. Because, you know, we have, we have that in society, that happens oftentimes, and even in the religious world, whether it's Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Hindu, doesn't matter, we, we, you know, certain kinds of clergy, certain people that have a religious title or, you know, status, when they walk by, it is known that they just, they just made a, a presence. You know, they made an entry. There's an entourage, there's a kind of holy presence around them, and everybody's like, oh, you know, there's... There's this, this uh, social status thing that we've created around religiously knowledgeable. And this is not just Muslims. This is in the psychology of religion. Christians do this. You know, Jews do this. Hindus do this. Right? And in fact, Muslims do it too. Muslims do it also. This kind of reverence. Now, the thing is, I should have love and respect for my teacher. And you're going to see that Musa is going to have humility to his teacher from the beginning. So there's two points of view. The student's point of view. And the teacher's point of view, I should have total respect for my teacher. But the teacher should not consider himself in this position of superiority except in the role of teaching. Except in the role of teaching. Yes, in teaching, I, I have a, a, a superiority. In teaching, I can tell you what to do. In teaching, I can, I can say, hey, you messed up, fix this. Do this again. I can talk down to you as a teacher. I can be disappointed in you. I can be proud of you. I'm talking down to you. But... When it comes to eating, we're eating the same food. When I don't deserve a special salam. I just have salamu alaikum wa alaikum salam like you. We're going to stand in the same row in prayer. In everything else, we're equal. What do we do, unfortunately? If someone has elevation in one respect, then we elevate them in every respect. Especially nowadays in Muslim society, you know what we do? When someone receives a high status in one area, like somebody becomes a doctor, then the rules don't apply to them. Then they're Dr. Saab at the restaurant, then they're Dr. Saab at <laughs> wherever they go, they're the doctor. Special treatment, expedited, you know. When people in, 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 in many Muslim countries, now that I've seen them up close and personal, when you make a certain amount of money, then the laws don't apply to you. And the rules and the lines don't apply to you. The passport line and the visa line and the hospital and doctor, they don't apply to you once you reach a certain level of money. Then you have your own rules, right? Because you reached a certain kind of status. And but this does not apply. This this is being negated in just the way Allah had Musa alayhi salam, okay, you know, come into contact with his teacher, just a slave from among our slaves. It's also in interesting to note that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the highest maqam that he reached, the highest station that he reached, was when he was elevated in the Mi'raj, right? That spiritual journey where he was elevated. And he is closest to Allah spiritually and physically now. Closest to Allah. And every time Allah describes the mi'raj, he uses the word abd. Subhanallah asra bi abdihi. Fa'awha ila abdihi ma awha. In Surah Al Najm, in Surah Al Isra, when he raises him, he takes him in the night. He didn't say, Subhanallah asra bi rasulihi. Subhanallah asra bi nabi bi abdihi. That journey that, that marks the highest position any man has ever reached is being described as what? Abd. Abd. So for me and you, the highest place we can reach, the most honorable position we can reach with Allah is actually Abd. The problem happens, the problem occurs with you and me when our study and our, and our pursuit of learning Allah's deen, which is for Allah, starts getting noticed by people. It's, it, so we're doing it for Allah, but who's noticing? People are noticing. And people are noticing and they're starting to give you shaykh status. Right? And they're starting to, you know, make you this holy figure. Right? A young man came to me yesterday, he said, I make some good videos online or whatever, and now I don't want to be held to this position. Okay, yeah, because that's what happens, right? This happened to me in New York, by the way. It's a New York story, I'll tell you. I, I was in um, Long Island many years ago and uh, when I started giving khutbah I was going through a phase so I used to wear a thobe and I had a much longer beard and some, some people consider this beard astaghfirullah we can discuss that at some other time but anyway I had a much longer beard I had a thobe I had a turban right and Jesus sandals I was, I was doing the whole look right so and I would give the khutbah and I was 21 years old and I would give the khutbah and when I would finish the khutbah old men from different countries in the world would want to come and 
almost in rukur to want to shake my hand. And then there would some people would bring their children, could you make dua for him? And other children would other would straight up just say, Could you on my child? And I realized that that's because of the way I look. The way I appear for some seems to I must be closer to Allah. Now the same person, if I just after salah took my stuff off and I went put the t-shirt on and played some basketball with the guys outside. Same guy would pass by, nothing. If, if I had my, you know, spiritual uniform on, and the same person would pass by, like, oh, please make dua for me, and my children, and bless my car, can you touch my car? You know, like, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Well, in other words, we, we associate, people will start giving you a position. You didn't want it. You're just doing what you think is in line with the sunnah of the messenger وسلم, or you're doing something that pleases Allah Azza wa Jal. and people around you, either people start insulting you because of your religion or people inflate your position because you're two extremes, right? But that's what you get. And people start doing that to you. And you know what? Human beings are a product of their environment. If you're in a, in a smelly place, the smell will come on your clothes, right? If you're in a polluted area, you'll get used to the pollution. And you know what? If you're getting you, if you're getting praised or being given a certain position all the time, recognized all the time, then you might start getting what? Start getting used to it that I'm being treated in this way, right? Or when I walk in, they ask me to lead the prayer, so I'm used to that, and I'm used to no, 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 I don't, no, I don't want. To. And then one time, nobody asked me to lead the prayer, and like, hey, what's going on here? I think I need to lower my mask a little bit. They need to recognize who I am, so. I mean, I'm still going to say no, but I miss being asked, <laughs> right? This is, this is not abdan min ibadina. This is not just one of our slaves. And that's, the, that's the, the beauty of this phrasing. The teacher is being introduced, first and foremost, not as someone who will have a relationship with his student, but someone who has a relationship with Allah. And as a result of it, he sees himself and Allah sees him as just one of many. Nothing special, nothing out of the ordinary. The other important thing here is, uh, and this, is, this gets a little bit philosophical, but an important subject to discuss. Allah told us that He will have Musa السلام, meet His teacher at a place where two oceans meet. Majma al Bahrain. The Quran calls it Majma al Bahrain. And in another place in the Quran, by analogy in Surah Al Rahman, Allah says, Maraj al Bahraini yal Marj al Bahraini yal taqiyan, right? Bainahuma barzakhun la yabghiya. They're between, so he, he, he fused two oceans together, two seas together that clash against each other, and between them there's a barrier that they refuse to cross. They don't violate that barrier, right? I've actually had the, had the honor of seeing that barrier in South Africa between the, you know, the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic and how there's two different temperatures of water, two different kinds of sea life, and you can see the two different textures of the water right on the, right on the sea. You know, subhanAllah. But it's also symbolic of something. Musa alayhi salam has been given, and by the way, the knowledge of Allah and the words of Allah have been described as an ocean. In which surah? In this surah. قُلْ لَوْ كَانَ الْبَحْرُ مِدَادًا لِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّي This is not an accident. If the words of Allah were turned into, if the oceans were turned into ink to write the words of Allah. So there's an association made with the oceans and the word of Allah. And Musa salam is going to meet someone where two different oceans meet. Now to put all of this together in a literary sense, bear with me, it's going to get a little bit philosophical. The knowledge of revelation, the knowledge of the Torah that was given to Musa salam, the revelation of the Quran that was given to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is from the oceans of knowledge, the oceans of the word of Allah, the words of Allah. That's one ocean, the ocean of revelation. This is ilm al wahi. This is ilm al wahi. But there's another book of Allah, not the book of Allah that has revelation, but the book of Allah that captures all of reality. That captures all of reality. إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ نَبْرَأَهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ Not anything occurs, not any calamity strikes, not any incident occurs. فِي السَّمَاءِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ Nothing happens in the extended universe 
or in, even inside of yourself. No cell is moving, no neuron is firing inside of yourself, except that's also documented inside of a book. Inside of a book that Allah describes. So there are, now there's two oceans, two books, two oceans. The, books of, the book of Revelation, and the book that's captured all of reality. All of what goes on. So two, two books, right? And Musa is supposed to go where two oceans meet. Where he's going to meet a teacher who Allah has given access to the other ocean. He has access to which ocean? Revelation. The teacher he's going to meet has access to which ocean? The, 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 the knowledge of reality. The reality of things. Haqiqat al ashya kamahiya. The reality of things. What this tells you, and what does Quran say about the two oceans? There's a barrier and they don't, they don't meet. Because Allah, the, the, the human beings that Allah taught revelation to, they're not supposed to know the other side. And the creatures, a human being even in this case, we don't know if he's human or angel, we, don't, we can't say for sure, but whoever he is, the abd of Allah, when he's been taught this ocean, he's not to know the other side. Which is why in the Sahih narration, when he meets with Musa alayhi salam, he says to Musa alayhi salam, Allah has taught you something I'm not supposed to know. And Allah has taught me something you're not supposed to know. Just like, بَيْنَهُمَا بَرْزَخٌ لَا يَبْغِيَانَ There's between them, there's a barrier, they're not supposed to cross. There are two different kinds of knowledge. And that's why Musa alayhi salam is going to learn something that is very different from revelation. Is very different from the books Allah revealed to prophets, from the teaching of right and wrong, from the teachings of halal and haram, from the stories of creation. It's different from all of that. These lessons are totally a different ocean. And you know, when you take a fish out of one kind of water, if it's salt water fish, and you put it in a different kind of water, different temperature, very difficult for it to survive. You understand? It can't tolerate it. And so he comes from this ocean of knowledge where he knows certain things about Allah through Allah's revelation. He meets this teacher and this teacher is from the other ocean, you see, from a completely different ocean of knowledge and he's going to meet them. Now you appreciate why they had to meet him where the two oceans meet, right? These two oceans of knowledge are going to meet at the place where the two oceans meet. It's really beautiful. So, فَوَجَدَ عَبْدًا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا Now how does, how does Allah describe this teacher? who's been given knowledge from that other ocean, the, the ocean of haqiqah, the reality of things, the, the, the secret behind things, the secrets behind things. About him, Allah says, آتَيْنَاهُ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا This is the first thing we learn about him. Allah has given him, that he had, we had granted him a special love and care that comes only from us. So before you learn anything about this person, we don't even know his name. We just know he's one of Allah's slaves. And we also know Allah has given him special love and care. You know what that means? فَاقِدُ الشَّيْءِ لَا يُعْطِيهِ Arabs say. If you don't have something, you can't give it. When Allah has given somebody love, then they exude love to others. When Allah has given someone patience, they exude patience to others. When Allah has given someone knowledge, they impart knowledge to others. When Allah has given someone rahmah, then what did they give to others? They give rahmah to others. They are a source of love and care for others. You understand? So when Allah says, آتَيْنَاهُ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا That Allah has given him this special rahmah, that means everything he does, whatever he does, has rahmah in it. A rahmah that comes, a mercy and love, that comes only from Allah. And then Allah says, adds on, وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا And we had taught him from our special vaults, a special kind of knowledge. Allamnahu would have been enough. Kafa bin nisbal in Loha. Right? Allamnahu. We taught him. Allamnahu. Milladunna. Bil idlafa ila maqal. He says, especially from our own behalf, from our special vaults. And then this maf'ul mutlaq, which can also be considered a maf'ul bihi. If you don't understand what I'm saying, learn Arabic. It's not that hard. Ilman. He, he, he taught him special knowledge. Some special kind of knowledge. This is Allah's way of saying that the knowledge of this ocean is not easily accessible. Is not accessible. And the knowledge of this ocean, unlike the knowledge of revelation, they're fundamentally different. They're fundamentally different. You know the knowledge of revelation teaches us to be grateful, yes? It teaches us to be grateful. But a human being could be grateful without ever having revelation learned. In fact, there are people who heard the Qur'an for the first time and they say, this is what we already believed. Their fitrah speaks to it. 
Their fitra already corresponds to what the revelation said. In fact, Christians came and heard the Qur'an and said, إِنَّا كُنَّا مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مُسْلِمِينَ In the Qur'an. They said, we were already Muslim in our hearts before this. They, they felt it already. Right? So then this ocean corresponds with human nature. But the other ocean is actually special, especially given to certain slaves. I won't go into the linguistic differences between min and milladuna. I've talked about that in other lectures. But it's suggesting that this knowledge is highly, highly exclusive. You don't get to have it. You don't have any inclination towards it. عَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمَا Okay, so now we learn that these are two different realities. Before, and it's better I establish that philosophical base for you before we get into the ayat. It'll make things easier. So, here's the thing. In Revelation, of, the, of all the Prophets, not just Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but the Torah given to Musa alayhi salam, the Injil given to Isa alayhi salam, the revelations given to Salih, Shu'aib, Nuh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Suhaf Ibrahim, you name it. The revelations, one of the things that revelations have is the difference between right and wrong. All of them. They have a difference between right and wrong. What you should do, what you should not do. It's always been there. And all revelations that Allah has sent have always... In, encouraged human beings, compelled human beings to be truthful and not be dishonest. For example, to be merciful, to be kind to parents, to keep family ties. There's some fundamental basic things that have passed down from one revelation to the next, to the next, to the next. They're consistent. Being grateful, being, being mindful, being just, etc, etc, etc. Right? So, in accordance with the revelations that have always been given, human beings know the difference between right and wrong. And where did they learn, where did they confirm this definition? From the word of Allah. This is, this is where we get philosophical. They get it from where? The word of Allah. The word of Allah taught us what is right and what is wrong. Fine. Whenever something happens in the world, whenever something happens in the world, does it not happen by the permission of Allah? Always. And whenever it happens, it's the word of Allah kun. And it becomes fayakun. So there's the word of Allah that is revelation and there's the word of Allah that is reality. There are two different words of Allah. I keep going back to two oceans, right? Two different kinds of words of Allah. Now, are there children that are innocent and in pain and sick in the hospital? Is that a reality? Yeah, it's a reality. Are there innocent people that are killed? Yeah, that's also a reality. Are there car accidents where somebody died who had, didn't make a mistake? The other person was driving badly and they died. The other person died. Yeah. Are there criminals who get away with their crime and are living, living a good life? Totally. And every one of those things could only have happened if what was there? Kun fayakun. Because none of, nothing can happen without the amr of Allah. Nothing. Now the thing is, all of these injustices, they look like injustices. They directly go against the other word of Allah. What's the other word of Allah? Injustices should not take place. Liars should be punished. Justice should be served. Ingratitude is not an acceptable quality. So in the word of Allah, there's a scheme of right and wrong. And in the reality that Allah created, there seems to be a totally different formula where you see plenty of contradiction against the word of Allah. If Allah says, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, how come He's letting it happen on this side in reality? You see the problem? You see that there are two conflicting things, conflicting realities? And this is actually, the, 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 this story is the Qur'an's way of merging the two realities. Because actually for atheists around the world, the number one argument, the number one problem they present to any believer in God, Muslim, Christian, Jew, doesn't matter. The issue they present is the problem of evil. If your God is so great, why is this happening, this happening? Well, how come your God lets this happen? In fact, Muslims say this too. In fact, uh, some, some Jews that I've met have even a more interesting take on it. They say, I, don't, I reject God. I hate God. I was like, but you're Jewish. He goes, yeah, but even hating Him is some kind of a relationship. So long as we have a relationship with God, is still a you know, connection to God. Why did he let the Holocaust happen? Why did he send us into the diaspora? Why did he let the Pharaoh you know, enslave us? Why did he do this? Why did he do this? We, I hate him. I don't want to listen to him. I complain to him all the time. I tell him I'm mad at him. I was like, you tell God you're mad at him? Yeah, I tell him I'm mad at him. Because he did all this stuff. I was like, well, yeah, because you know, that's the kind of relationship we have with God. It's like, okay. Or, it's brave of you. <laughs> 
But I could see where it's coming from, right? It's coming from, well, if your revelation says that you are merciful, kind, generous, and then I see lack of mercy, lack of generosity, injustice. Allah is just, but the world is unjust. The world that He created is clearly unjust. Allah is merciful, but you see plenty of mercilessness all around you. Allah is truthful, yet He's tolerating liars. He's tolerating deception. So how do you merge these two realities? How do you reconcile them? And yet all of this is happening by the permission of Allah. This is what Musa salam is going to learn about a little bit. And through him us. Because this is not a small crisis of faith. This is a pretty big crisis of faith. You all know that this surah is associated with the greatest trials that will hit humanity towards the end of time. Right? And that, that great trial, if you study the hadith surrounding that trial, one of its uh, manifestations is that believers will wake up a believer and by the time, or you know, or go to sleep a believer, by the time they wake up, they're not a believer. Or they wake up a believer, by the time they go to sleep, they're not a believer. They'll have a crisis of faith. They'll have an absolute crisis of faith. So it's pretty amazing that before this surah comes to an end, Allah deals with what will be the most powerful crisis of faith in, in, in this story. So he finds this, let's, let's move quickly. He finds this mysterious teacher. And then he says to him, Musa Salam says to him, Shall I follow you that you might teach me? Can I please follow you so that you might teach me? In other words, I know that learning from you is not just sitting here and listening to you. The kind of learning I need to do with you requires what? Following. So you know how, uh, for those of you that are in the sciences, you study the theory of engineering, but there's the hands-on engineering. Or you can study theoretically, you can study medicine, but then there's surgery itself and shadowing a doctor and residency and all of that. There's the hands-on experience. Learning our religion, the revelation, is given by way of words, isn't it? It's the word of Allah. It's the words of the Prophet ﷺ. That's how the religion is passed down. It's words that are being passed down, right? And then accenting or complementing that word of Allah is the practice of prayer and all of these other things, right? But this journey, this teacher, is actually more about you following him. Just do what he does. Or just observe, observation, right? So he tells him, can I follow you? Shall I follow you? So that you might teach me. From whatever you have been taught. Rushda. Some, some right, upright thing. So Rushd is important here. I want to know, because Musa is always learning, trying to better himself. And Rushd means someone who's correcting themselves towards the right, towards the right course. So he, as much as guidance, he's the recipient of Allah's book. And yet he's saying, I could be more guided even now. I could, if Allah is saying I can learn, there must be more uprightness I can accomplish. I can steer my course in the right direction even more. So he humbles himself and says, my, my motivations for learning is I want to, basically, I'll put it in simple English, I want to become a better person. I'll follow you so I could have more rushd. Right? And he's also saying, you may have been taught many things, but the rushd that you have been taught, I'd like to take some of that. And this teacher of his, immediately he knew Allah told him that it's going to be Musa bin Israel. The hadith tells us that he already knew him. So he's expecting him. And he knows which ocean he's already drawn from. And he knows that when you learn something from the ocean of revelation that teaches you right and wrong, when you come to this other ocean that teaches you about, or, or that shows you the reality of things, you're not going to be able to bear it. So his immediate response is, إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعِيَ صَبْرَةً no, You... For sure, you're, you're not capable of patience with me. You're not going to be able to have patience with me. He, he didn't assess Musa alayhi learning ability. And by the way, I've said this in my lectures before. Musa alayhi is actually pretty, it's pretty epic to say to Musa alayhi I don't think you have the patience. Because Musa alayhi tolerated living under Fir'aun with a lot of sabr. Musa salam saw the Israelites enslaved before his eyes and not be able to do something about it for, with a lot of sabr. Musa salam traveled through Madian in the desert with a lot of sabr. Musa salam spent many years of his life living out in Madian, not being able to go back to his own mother with a lot of sabr. 
Musa alayhi came back and heard many insults from the from Fir'aun and the attacks of the of the chiefs of the of the pharaohs for several years with a lot of sabr. Musa alayhi traveled the water across the water with a lot of sabr, and then he dealt with the hypocrisy of the Israelites when he was out in the desert with Manna and Selwa and the Qatl and the, the twelve springs with an enormous amount of sabr. And his teacher sees him and says, "Yeah, you don't actually have sabr for this." And you're like, are you sure? Because he's, he's pretty sabr. <laughs> he's a pretty powerful example of sabr. In the, but his sabr has to do with this ocean. What he's going to learn here, even someone as powerful in his sabr as Musa alayhi salam, this might be too much for him. He can't handle this. What is, and by the way, Musa alayhi salam represents all of us in this surah. Why? Allah will show him things about reality that we all want to know about. You know the question? Why, how come Allah did this though? How come my brother got his green card? I got deported. How come my cousin got married? My, even my fat cousin got married. My ugly cousin got married. How come I can't get married? How come this one, this one, this one? How come my brother, my, my sister's taller than me and Allah made me shorter? How come this? How, what was Allah's reasoning? Why did, I, why did that even happen? Why in the world, you know, one brother came to me recently, Allah protect him, he decided to invest, I don't endorse it, in, in Bitcoin or some, some, some bit something, right? And he just, he put $10,000 in it. And he got impatient for a week, he couldn't do it, he sold it for $10,000. He got it for the same money, sold it for the same money. The next day, it jumped, you know, 10,000%. And he could have been a multimillionaire overnight. And I, I ran into him at a shawarma place and he's telling me, why did Allah do that to me? How come, what was his reason for, can you tell me like, okay, I was like, hold on, let me check my phone. Let me see what Allah's reason was. I was like, what, where, I don't have access to this ocean, bro. <laughs> Nobody does. We don't know why that happened. Because <laughs> is Allah teaching me something? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. You know, that's got to hurt, that's got to sting, but it is what it is. So here, what, what we're going to see, Musa a.s. is being told, you don't have the patience to deal with, to, because what, what you'll find every time, Musa a.s. has the same question. You know what that question is? Why? Why'd you do that? Why? How could you? Why? 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 Now, the revelation of Allah, the Quran, the Torah before the Injil, all the revelations of Allah, they never answer the question what? Why? Why were you born in this century? Why were you why were you born to these parents? You look at sometimes you look at your brother and you say, Why are you my brother? Right? So <laughs> you don't have the answer to why. And human beings really want the answer to why. And Allah, you know what Allah's answer to why is? Trust him. Allah is, the answer to why in the Quran, in Revelation is Allah is Al-Rahman, Allah is Al-Rahim, Allah is Al-Hakim, Allah is, uh, you know, <laughs> Allah is Al-Had, Allah is wise, Allah is to be trusted, Allah is loving and caring. Allah, wait, so this bad thing that happened is still Allah is loving? Yes, He is, trust it. Okay. Well, can you explain? No, they can't explain, just trust it. Somebody gets sick, we say, La Lahur, inshallah, no problem, it'll purify your sins. There must be some khair in it. There must be some good in it. Mm -hmm, some good in it. You don't want to accept it. But the revelations tell us just trust Allah. Musa alayhi salam is going to experience things. It's not, it's not just the qadr of Allah, it's the, his teacher. His, you know, you, you go to somebody to learn your deen, you're going to say, I'm going to learn the deen from someone who has better akhlaq than me, who has better manners than me, who's, who's got more patience than I do. They've got better speech than I do. I can, when I'm around them, I feel like being a better person. I'm more calm. So he's, it's really interesting. Musa alayhi and he were talking and they boarded the ship. And they, in the hadith, it tells us that a bird came and it pecked into the sea twice. Naqra'u naqratain, the hadith says. Pecked twice. And then he, his teacher turned to Musa alayhi salam, Khadir, turned to Musa alayhi salam, and he said, you know, my knowledge and your knowledge is like these two drops, and the rest of it is Allah's knowledge. Right? Which is really cool, because that means the revelation of Allah is just a drop from this side. 
And the, the knowledge of reality on this side that Khadr has is just a drop from the knowledge of actual reality. And this is important because even when he explains why the reason was what it was, the reason is only one drop among the larger reasons. So there may be may, way more to the reasons, but we're only going to get one drop out of the full reasons. The drop that he has been given. The drop that he has been given. So now, as they board, I'm, I'm summarizing the story, as they board the, 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 the ship, he's going to start tearing the ship open. And by the way, according to the hadith, this happened immediately. So he, imagine this, the, your knowledge and my knowledge are like this bird that just pecked into the sea, these drops is nothing compared to the rest of the ocean. And this spiritual profound moment where Musa alayhi salam is taking in that deep epic quote, next thing you know, he's got an ax and he's hammering down the bottom deck of the ship. <laughs> like in the middle of the spiritual, imagine I'm giving this lecture right now and all of a sudden I take a brick and I hurl it at the, you know, like, <laughs> or I start axing down this table as part of your lesson. You're like, what's going on? What are you doing? You know, and so he's in shock. He doesn't know, and he says, you and he kept hacking away until the water started coming out and they're at the bottom deck so the people above can't see so they can't see it and they don't know what's going on and it's just you've done something so terrible what you're gonna drown those people they gave us a ride why are you doing this and he calmly turns to Musa salam and says I explained to you you're not gonna have patience with me this is part of your education well, this is a different kind of university. <laughs> so he's just straight up tells you, you're, you, can't, you can't be patient with me. Obviously the ship gets damaged, they have to pull back towards land. They didn't get very far. And Musa is still shell-shocked by what happened. They get to the beach, they see a child. There are a bunch of kids playing. And he's still like trying to take in, like I'm supposed to learn deen from this person? This person is going to teach me what's right and wrong? And by the way, from the, from the revelation's point of view, damaging somebody's property, attempting to kill somebody, ruining somebody's livelihood, all of these are haram or no? They're absolutely haram. So Musa alayhi salam having a problem with it is because all he's ever known from the teachings of Allah disturbs him about what just happened. He should be disturbed. So what he does is the right thing. He does the right, he can't talk, because when you have iman, you don't have sabr for injustice. So when he said, you're not going to have sabr with me, it's the right kind of lack of sabr. We're not supposed to have sabr for injustices. And so Musa is actually from the human point of view and from a believer's point of view in the right. He's actually right. And they get to the sea, they get to the beach and he kills somebody, he kills a child. And if you follow the hadith literature, it's a brutal murder. It's actually a ruthless murder. And that's actually where I'm going to pick up from tomorrow. We're going to talk about that ayah of the murder. But today, because I, I delved into the philosophical side, I just want to explain a couple of premises to you that will make those durus easier. Because then from tomorrow on, inshallah, we're going ayah by ayah a little bit deeper. Right? That's 74. So what I want to explain to you is, um, with this story, we're going to learn that the, the right and wrong that Allah has taught us the right and wrong that Allah has taught us is for us to know and us to live by. While Allah created a reality that is constantly going against this. And you have to face the, con the contradiction to this in reality all the time. Jazakallah khairan. Iftaqadnaakum. Okay. So we have to, we, th there's going to be two conflicting realities and they're both coming from Allah Azza wa According to what we know, what you're going to see happen in the world will look very evil. But we cannot see the way Allah sees things. Allah is al-basir. He sees the entire reality. So in simple words, here's how I can explain it to you. You know, there are a million possibilities. He could have killed the child. He could have hurt the child. He could have left the child alone. And you know, with every, every choice you make, there are multiple ramifications, right? A series of events, domino effect, right? So there's domino effect if you kill the child, if there's a domino effect if you leave the child, there's a domino effect if you don't damage the ship, there's a domino effect if you do damage the ship, when you damage it, every action leads to a series of other reactions, right? Think of it this way. If Allah somehow gave you the map of every possibility, 
with every choice. All the reactions that will happen. And he showed it to you. Then you would pick the same choice that actually happened as the best choice. There, there's a, because we don't see the larger picture, right? So we just see the immediate incident. We don't see how it plays into a larger reality because we don't have the full map in front of us. Who's got the full map? Allah Azza wa Jal. We just see this one piece and it's leading to one other piece. We can't see a thousand pieces from now. Easy, a positive example of that is Yusuf alayhi salam. It's easy one to remember. Yusuf alayhi salam got kidnapped as a child. Yes or no? That can't possibly be a good thing. But if he wasn't kidnapped as a child, he would not have been sold into slavery. And if he wasn't sold into slavery, he would have never been falsely accused. And if he wasn't falsely accused, he would have never been in jail. And if he was never in jail, he would have never interpreted dreams. And if he never interpreted dreams, he would have never become eventually the, the minister of Egypt to run its finances. And if he never became the minister of Egypt to run his finances, Egypt would have died. Thousands of people would have died in a drought because the only reason Egypt survived the drought season and you know mass famine and hundreds of thousands of family, men, women, children dying of starvation is because Yusuf salam interpreted the dream. And, so, and by the way, his family would never have been reunited and his brothers would have never made tawbah. None of this would have happened if he didn't get kidnapped. And if he didn't get, some bad stuff happened to him. But if it didn't happen to him, the bad stuff would have happened to way more people. You understand that? There would have, the, the ramifications of the, 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 the harm that would have spread is way, way more. There's no way for us to see the whole picture. Human beings, our minds aren't designed to see the whole picture. They're just not designed to see it. And Allah will teach us in this surah, that there are situations in our life that people do things that are horrible. People do things that are despicable. And when they do them, we cannot process. We, obviously it isn't fair. But at, at one level, we should fight against it. At the other level, we still know, even as we're fighting against it, there's a larger plan of Allah at work. These are two conflicting beliefs, but they have to coexist for us. On the one hand, we will fight against injustice. On the other, even as the injustice is happening and they're, 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 the, the unjust are winning, there's a larger plan, there's a benefit at work. Even when Rasul Sallallahu was you know, injured at Uhud and almost killed, there was a larger plan at work. Even when our mother Aisha radiallahu anha was accused and her, her honor was degraded and for nearly a month or more, she was being slandered in the entire city of Medina and our Prophet gets to hear horrific things about his own wife being said all around the city for over the course of a month. There was still, what did Allah say? بَلْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ is good for you. None of the people who did slander were doing something good. But the event itself had some good in it because Allah sees what? The larger picture. Allah sees the larger. That's the, that's the reality of, that's the haqiqah that human beings don't have access to. And that's what we're going to be shown. Like that curtain will be lifted a little bit on the source code of reality. We just see the surface reality. There's a source code behind it. And Allah will show us just a little bit of that in this, in this story. So inshallah, from tomorrow on, I'm going to try to take on ayah number 74, where we're going to look at you know, the shocking killing of a child and how that is going to give a reaction. Well, what reaction Musa alayhi salam is going to have towards it. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.